Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Plant Based Kidney Health. My name is Michelle Crosmer. I'm a renal dietitian, and I am with Dr. Sean Hashmi, who is a nephrologist. And we're excited to be back with you guys. We have another, actually, couple of exciting topics to talk about today that come up all the time, and we get tons of questions on. Um, so we're going to be talking about detoxes, cleanses, and fasting, and how that um, relates to kidney disease and kidney health. So to get started with that, Dr. Hashmi, um, let's start with detoxes and cleanses. But can you talk about, um, I guess, just kind of what they are and then how they relate to kidney health and any potential benefits or risks? Yeah, so when it comes to things like detoxes, you know, I, I've been doing nephrology now, gosh, for the better part of 13 plus years. And in all of the time that I've been doing nephrology, I've always been asked about this juice concoction or this herbs and can it be used to detox the kidney? And I have to tell you, I have yet to find a single piece of evidence that says any detox of any form whatsoever works. So there are so many people that talk about all sorts of different types of things going on that may potentially work. But remember, your kidney is already the detoxing machine. You're not going to detox the detoxer, right? <laughs> it just... It, there isn't a mechanism to be able to do that. So if you say, well, okay, fine, that's all great, but what can I do to clean my kidney? And the answer is very simple. It's the same thing we, we talk about, which is, once again, drinking enough water per day makes a difference. So water is the first place to start. And by the way, don't worry about if it's mineral or filtered or all that. Just drink the water. It will do you good. Number two is, is lower your salt because we have shown time and time again that the more salt you get, the more protein you're going to spill, the faster you're going to get that scarring in the kidney. Remember, no detox is ever going to get rid of the scarring that's forming in the kidney. And the point is this, is you got to prevent the scarring. When the cells are dead, so people always ask, if I'm on dialysis, can I come back? You know, I know somebody who did X diet and as a result of it, they came back. It wasn't necessarily because they came back and, and it's miraculous. It's because what happened in those kidneys were the cells weren't scarred. They were injured. There's a difference. It's the same thing as if I cut off your finger, you're not getting that finger back. But if I cut your finger, it can heal. Yes, you'll have a scar there, but it can heal and you can get back to doing what you're doing. So never forget that distinction. And that's why when you're on dialysis, we're not somebody that's going to give you false promises. We're going to be honest and we're going to give you hope that's real. And there's so much you can do on dialysis. So salt matters, processed foods. Once again, processed foods are going to accelerate the decline. They're going to cause more scarring. We know that alcohol is directly linked not just because of liver kidney syndrome, which is called hepatocellular or HRS or liver cirrhosis that leads to kidney problems going on. But what we're talking about is alcohol will directly damage the kidneys. Artificial sweeteners. We've talked about how artificial sweeteners, along with sugar, but artificial sweeteners especially, they mess up your gut microbiome. They take those tight junctions and they make them leaky. And as a result, not only do you create more toxins in the gut, you allow the passage of more of those toxins to go from the gut to inside your body going on. Of course, animal fat, our last episode that you guys watched, we talked about animal fat leading directly to protein in the urine and of course, animal protein. So everybody who's thinking there is a detox and I know so many websites are selling them. If there was any evidence, I will come back on this uh, podcast and episode and I will apologize and say I was wrong. But right now I have scoured the literature to find any evidence to say there is a detox that actually improves or stops the progression of kidney disease. Yeah. And one of the things too that um, is important to point out, a lot of these what like supplements and stuff that um, you know, make claims of detoxing or cleansing, you'll see that they, you know, if you look at a lot of the fine lines, the fine print of it, they'll say, you know, supports like normal kidney function or supports healthy kidney function. And so they're not tested in people with declined kidney function or with kidney disease. And they usually have a medical disclaimer that like, if you have any sort of disease, you need to check with your medical professional because they can make all these claims. But it, again, it's, 
even if they're, they are being studied, it's not in the population of people that have declined kidney function. And that's what we want to see to see something that's safe. If it's effective versus you know, something that's just saying a normal, normal kidney function or someone without kidney disease. Yeah, that is such an excellent point. And just remember, if they say, you know, like clinically evaluated, that doesn't mean anything because some supplements, and we're going to get into this in a later question today, but some supplements are only tested and shown to be effective in what we call in vitro studies. That means that inside a lab, in a Petri dish, in that controlled environment, on individual cells, they work. But when you look at the human body, they weren't done in a clinical study. And a lot of times what's worked inside or in an in vitro study, it doesn't translate out into an in vivo study. Meaning when we do clinical trials, we don't find that same result. So please be very, very careful before you put your hard earned dollars. There's a lot of people who want to offer hope, but you have to have real hope. And you can't let people who are vulnerable get taken advantage of. All right. So Michelle, let me ask you then, you know, can we then talk specifically about juice detoxes? Because there's always questions about that. And for some reason, I get asked a lot about celery juice. <laughs> so do I. Um, so I think the, the there's lots of information on Google, right? Like research-wise, no. But the um, the thought behind celery in general is, and the claims made is that celery helps to um, remove toxins and waste. And so we think of, okay, well, that's we're helping our kidneys if we do that. Um, there's no actual evidence on celery juice and kidney disease and kidney health any whatsoever. Um, you actually like nothing comes up when you search PubMed and you search for actual like, research on it. So um, one, there's just, there's not research on it. But two, the thing with juices, um, a couple of things are risky. One with, um, you know, you lose the fiber. So any amount of juicing, whether it's a vegetable or it's the fruit, all that, you know, the gunk and the stuff that's left behind, that's where the fiber is. And so you're getting all of the sugar from the fruit or the veggie and you're not getting any of the fiber. And then another thing is you get a lot higher amounts um, and more concentrated amounts of different vitamins and minerals, which I think a lot of times that's what the selling point is for juice cleanses. But again, we come back to, okay, well, how much potassium then is in that? So like pota or celery juice can have a ton of potassium in it where just eat the celery, you know, eat the celery, add it to a salad, to a stir fry, to your soup. And if there's these, you know, potential benefits, you're going to get it from eating the actual vegetable or from eating the actual fruit. You don't need to be juicing it, removing the fiber, and then having very concentrated amounts of, um, of that food and of that potassium when you have it. And that's the risk. And the other thing too is, especially if it's like a fruit juice, is the sugar content. And I think we've talked about this in a past episode, but, you know, think of the amount it takes, you know, multiple four or five oranges to get a glass of orange juice. So you're getting all of the sugar from that and none of the fiber, where if you just ate the orange or you just ate the celery, or you just ate the, the beet, or, you know, I'm just trying to think of ones that are commonly in these like cleanses. Um, it's a lot better just to eat the actual product instead of juicing it and then having very concentrated amounts of it. Now that makes so much sense. And I, I tell you, this is such a recurrent topic and, you know, people are always looking for solutions, but juicing anything, I just don't see why that would ever be a good idea. Yeah. And you can blend it. I mean, that's where like blend, yes. blend it up in a smoothie and that sort of thing. You're yes. still, you're not removing the fiber when you do that. Um, so, I mean, people make great green smoothies and stuff and you can put celery in that and you put apple and you can put leafy greens and ginger and lemon, all this stuff, but it's not the like juicing of it. You're keeping everything whole. You're just blending it up and making it into like a tasty beverage or a tasty, you know, bowl that you're having. Um, but yeah, I think that's the thing. I, I wish that we had this miracle cleanse or miracle, um, juice that we could recommend to you guys. But, you know, I think in general, it's important to remember like that, like you said, this is what your kidneys are meant to remove waste products and toxins. And we want to, um, have a lifestyle and diet that supports, um, a lot, letting our kidneys do that and reducing how much, um, you know, protein waste we're putting in or how much processed food added sugar, if we reduce or eliminate that, then our kidneys are able to do their job more efficiently. And we don't have to be, you know, paying lots of money for different, um, cleanses and pills and supplements because we're helping our kidneys to do the job that 
they're meant to do. Um, okay. So transitioning then a little bit away from the juices and the cleanses, um, and we got asked this a lot in a lot of different ways, but, um, is fasting safe for people with kidney disease? And what about different types of fasting? There's like intermittent fasting, there's water only fasting, um, there's extended periods of times of fasting. So what can you tell us about that? So, you know, when it comes to fasting, what's, what's interesting about fasting is it's not a new thing. Every religion Every culture has a form of fasting. And a lot of times fasting is done because it's a form of um, what people feel like creating discipline. And when you look at even in religions, when they do it, it's really trying to help people to be able to have that discipline in their selves to be able to you know, do the right thing, be good and, and so forth. Now, what's interesting about fasting is, is what's old has now become, you know, new and in fashion and everybody wants to do it. And there's all these technical terms. So let me define fasting in a very, very simple way for you guys to understand. There are two ways to look at fasting. One is called intermittent. Intermittent is really the shorter terms of fasting going on. Those are things like alternate day fasting, your five and two, and we're going to explain all of that, and your time restricted. So that is your intermittent. Then you have another category, and that category is periodic. And periodic fasting is what you do once in a while. So, for example, there may be a prolonged water fast where you're doing a water fast for a week to two weeks, you know, once every three, four months. Or there's Walter Longo's Fast Mimicking Diet or FMD. What you're doing is, is about five days of fasting every three months or so. So you have intermittent and you have periodic. Now, let's start with intermittent. Alternate day is exactly what it sounds like. You're basically eating food regularly one day or a little bit more than what you would normally eat. And then the next day you're fasting or having a really, really small meal. So in the medical terms, it'll be 100 to 125% of your calories one day and less than 25% of your calories the next day. That's alternate day. The term five and two, you can look at many different ways. Some people do five and two as, for example, Monday, Tuesday, I'm eating normally. Wednesday, I'm fasting. Thursday, Friday, I'm eating normally. Saturday, I'm fasting. And you keep doing it. So you can have it so that there's five days out of the week where you're eating normally and two days you're fasting. Some people do five days, Monday through Friday, eating normally and Saturday, Sunday, they fast. The problem with both of those these diets is the alternate day and the five and two, when you do them and you do that fast for 24 hours, as soon as you stop, you are super ridiculously hungry, if that's a term. So what happens is you get so hungry and so famished that you end up overeating the next day, and that's what makes it harder. But the third type of intermittent fasting, what we call time-restricted, is the one that's the most exciting. And the reason it's so exciting is because it's the only type of fasting that doesn't stimulate ghrelin. And remember, ghrelin is your hunger hormone. So how does time-restricted feeding work? So basically, you're picking a shorter amount of time. So it turns out that people eat between 12 to 14 hours a day. And you'd be like, wait, what? Yeah, it's actually true. So if you think about it, from 7 a.m. to like 9, 10 o'clock at night, there's people who are eating that long. So people eat a lot. What the studies show is that if you reduce that time to 6 to 10 hours of eating and the rest fasting, you get all of these amazing metabolic benefits. As little as going down to 10 hours starts the benefit cycle on there according to data. So if you're doing like, you know, 12 hours of eating and 12 hours of fasting, no real benefit that we have seen, but 10 or less. Where's the sweet spot? The sweet spot is really around six to eight hours. Most people at eight hours is the perfect balance. Now, when you talk about that six to eight hours, there's a few caveats to that you got to remember. First, a lot of people say, you know, I like to have my eight hour window from 12 p.m. to 8 p.m. The problem is, is as the evening progresses, you're going to find that whatever food you eat, it's more likely to hang around your system. Insulin's actions are being blunted, so it's not able to get rid of all of those calories. There's more chance for it, especially if it's like a high fat or high sugar meal to do more damage. The best way to eat is while the sun is up. Follow your circadian rhythm. So what that means is make your uh, eight-hour window like breakfast. You would start 
and then go eight hours beyond that. So it would be breakfast, lunch, and maybe you get a snack in. And that's it. You're done. Now, if people are like, oh, my God, but I'm going to miss dinner with my family, that's fine. Make it so that some days you do have that dinner. But if you're saying what is the most optimal way, what the data shows is the most optimal way is to follow your circadian rhythm. It matters. Just like people who do night shifts. People always ask me, but I work nights. I stay up all night. Is there a solution for that? Unfortunately, there is no solution for that. It just doesn't exist. And so as a result of it, you have to know that, for example, people who work nights, they end up gaining more weight. There's no way around that. In fact, adding as little as an hour of sleep each night can actually make you eat 270 calories less each day. So time-restricted feeding is the one we like. Now, when it comes to CKD, intermittent fasting, specifically time-restricted feeding, is the one that we recommend because it will improve those metabolic markers. What are they? It can improve your A1Cs, it can improve your blood pressure, and of course, it can improve your weight. What's the downside to the intermittent fasting story? Well, first is when you fast, what happens to your insulin levels? It goes down. Insulin is needed to do what to potassium? Remember the potassium thing that we had? It drives potassium into cells. So in the absence of insulin, you're going to get high potassium. So if you're somebody who's already prone to high potassium and you start fasting, your potassium might get a lot higher and you need to know that. So be very, very mindful of that. Of course, if you're somebody who's on insulin, your fasting period is not going to work simply because of the fact that your sugars are going to bottom out. So people who are already on insulin, they have to be very, very careful. If you're pregnant, please don't do fasting. Just don't do it. You're not worried about you. You're feeding the baby. This is why we don't want you to do any diets while you are pregnant, right? What we want you to do is just maintain a healthy weight, gain healthily. But don't go on a diet that is not the time to lose weight. You are feeding two people. And the person that's inside you, they need nutrients. They don't need crap. So this is not the time to go for burgers and fries. This is the time to focus on healthy food for you. That's also going to translate into healthy food for the baby going on. Also, if you have cancer and you have kidney disease, same thing. During those times, fasting becomes very tricky because we know the risk of dying increases the more you lose weight. So you have to be very, very careful because what the studies show is loss of muscle mass is linked to higher mortality. Okay, now let's jump to periodic fasting. So periodic fasting, the one that's really scary for guys like me is the prolonged water fast. If you're going to do anything like that, and I strongly recommend you don't, because the problem is, is as soon as you stop it, you're going to be so hungry, you go back and you're going to start eating. And within a few weeks, you're going to have regained all the weight. And I see this time and time again. People do great during the prolonged water fasting. They're getting their blood test. They have to do it. And they're very close physician supervision. We have to monitor their electrolytes because it can actually be quite dangerous. So remember, high potassium, low potassium, they can both kill you. Right? We're going to have episodes coming up on calcium. High calcium, low calcium, you can get all sorts of stuff happening from that. So electrolyte issues can be very dangerous. And if you're not getting anything but water, you're diluting out everything, your salt, which can cause seizures, coma, and death. And so as a result, you must do it under supervision. Any kind of prolonged water fasting, it doesn't make sense to me because whatever plan you pick, you want to build a habit out of it. The only plan that allows you to build a habit is time-restricted feeding because it makes it so that you do a similar thing every day. You may be somebody who says, you know, maybe I just do it Monday through Friday and on the weekends. I enjoy the time with my family. That's great. But be very mindful of the fact that whenever you see something that sounds really too good to be true, it's too good to be true. What the data shows on calorie restriction and fasting is that there is no difference in weight loss between just cutting your calories or fasting. But the place where fasting is so effective for kidney patients is the fact that it helps to improve the gut microbiome. And that's really key because a lot of your toxins are coming from the bacteria in the gut. They're going inside the body by restoring the tight junctions once again inside your gut. You are able to reduce that by getting a better mix of bacteria. You're able to reduce the amount of toxins forming. So can you do it? 
in chronic kidney disease, yes. But if you are somebody who suffers from high potassium, please be very careful. So that is the thing. Now, other stuff you got to remember, fasting is not without side effects. So there's lots of side effects that people experience. And in kidney patients, these are much more exaggerated. Sleep disturbance, people get tired, they have dry mouth. Some people experience back pain. That Part of that is, is because when you hydrate them, it goes away. Bad breath, hunger, headache, muscle pain, abdominal bloating. It's an interesting phenomenon that when you start to fast, some people, they get pretty significant bloating going on. Some people will get diarrhea while others would get really bad constipation. And then the last thing is, is during the hours of fasting, you still need to drink liquids because dehydration is a very real phenomenon. Yeah. Wow. That's a great explanation. So then summarizing that the time restricted feeding would be the best um, option for someone who does have kidney disease, but you still want to be mindful of um, if you're on insulin, if you have diabetes, or if you have high blood potassium levels. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So Michelle, if somebody does decide, let's say they're going to do intermittent fasting, then what are some tips or tricks that you know they can learn in terms of how to spread out their nutrient intake during that eating window. So let's say they're doing TRF. What are some things to note about how to eat? Well, I think the most important thing, which, and you, you touched on it, um, is you still want to ideally be spreading out, you know, your meals and snacks. And so I think a lot of times we get, and then the timing that you're consuming them. So if you're, um, depending what, let's say it's an eight hour window that you're eating, you ideally want that to be, um, you know, potentially your larger meals as the breakfast or lunch meal versus the dinner time meal. Um, the other thing is, and just in general is regard, like if you're fasting or if you're time restricted feeding, regardless of the window of eating that you're eating in, it's important, the food that you're actually consuming. And so, um, I, you know, I think some people go this route, but most people don't, but it's, it's not this free for all, like, oh, well, I'm only eating in an eight hour window so I can have whatever I want. And it doesn't matter. It does still matter. And we still want to be, you know, fueling your body, ideally doing, a, you know, whole food, minimally processed plant predominant diet. So I think that's the most important thing. But then, like you said, and like we said, is spreading it out. We, what we usually don't want to see is, okay, well, I'm going to have this one large giant meal all at once because all your potassium, all your sodium, all your protein, everything is just all at one time. First, if we spread it out, you know, maybe you just have two meals and a snack, or maybe you just have two meals, but it's still, um, spread out. And then, you know, and then you can say, okay, I'm eat two meals in the day and I need, let's say 60 grams of protein. Then you can split it up amongst those two meals or, you know, two meals in a snack. And so I'd say that's the most important thing. So what you're eating is so important. And then the timing and trying to avoid the largest meal being in that nighttime evening time where we're less active. Um, it's dark out and usually we eat dinner and then we, sit on the couch, we watch a movie, we watch TV, we read a book, we talk with, you know, your significant other. Um, we're just a lot less active in the evening. So, um, having it more with that breakfast and lunch meal. Um, other than that, I mean, and staying well hydrated, I think that's the the most important thing as far as tips for spreading it out and then still ensuring, um, you know, sometimes people, if they normally eat like 14 hours and they're cutting it to eight, they might be cutting out an entire meal. And so you still, that's where tracking your intake, you still want to make sure you're getting enough of the macronutrients and micronutrients that you need so that you're not, you know, potentially becoming deficient or depriving yourself of anything. And so that's where I would say, just track and log what you're having, um, in that, eight or that 10 hour or whatever that window is that you're eating to make sure you're still meeting all your targets of what your needs are since you have cut that time down. Um, you know, cause if you normally have four meals a day and you've cut it down to two, but you didn't change anything with the food that you're eating, you might be missing out on important vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that you need. Um, so that would, those would be my main tips. Awesome. And then I think somebody was asking about, um, resveratrol. Yeah. And so, I think what they were just asking with that was, um, is taking like a supplement of that cannot mimic the, um, the impact of fasting. 
Yeah, the answer is no. So that's a really quick answer. Just keep in mind, here's the problem with resveratrol, quercetin, and a few of the other ones. There was a lot of promise because in vitro studies showed that there would be a lot of benefits. Remember, in vitro studies, they're looking at cellular functions going on. But when you look at resveratrol, for example, the issue is, is one, it absorbs very poorly. Two, it gets broken down and eliminated from the body very, very quickly. So when you take it orally, it's kind of like vitamin K2. When we talk about the different subtypes of vitamin K2, we recommend MK7 over MK4 because of the fact that MK4 gets absorbed very poorly. So here, resveratrol gets absorbed very, very poorly. And what's the source of resveratrol? It's fruits. So eat your fruits. That's literally the bottom line. But all of the beneficial studies were done either in animals or in in vitro, meaning cellular models. And some had benefits and some didn't. So what we don't know is what is the proper dose? Does it even do anything? And knowing all of that, some of the resveratrol brands are very expensive. So whether or not it does anything, the jury is still out. It's not like turmeric and some of the other stuff that's out there where there's a lot more data on curcumin and other stuff that we have. On resveratrol, it was so much hype in the past for all sorts of things, including obesity. But unfortunately, that hype is starting to fade a little bit. And part of that is is simply because of the route in which it goes through. It just doesn't get into the body that well. All right. Thank you for explaining that. And that's all that we have today for detoxes, cleanses, fasting. Um, You guys can always um, send us your questions, plantbasedkidneyhealth at gmail.com. If you can subscribe, like, share, um, leave us a review on, if you're listening to this on podcast, we'd really appreciate it. And we thank you guys for tuning in, asking great questions, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.